Welcome, everyone. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, uh, wherever you are, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the third webinar organized by Arafura and Timor Sea's Ecosystem Action at C2 and Oil Spill Response Limited, OSRL. So this is the third webinar of the year. Actually, this is the second to the last webinar scheduled for this year. Uh, at C2 and OSRL has collaborated this year to deliver quarterly webinars. So basically, this is our second to the last webinar of the year. So I am Norman Lorica Ramos from Oil Spill Response Limited, uh, the facilitator for this webinar. Uh, our hope is to share learning and have productive discussions through this webinar. Uh, before we start, I would like to lay the ground rules uh, of this webinar. And please take note that our webinar is also streamed live in at C2 YouTube channel. So before we start, I would like to request everybody uh, or everyone to be respectful at all times. Please avoid using all caps letters in your chat box when communicating. Uh, please keep your microphones at mute and videos off at all times. Uh, please type your messages or questions in the chat box and we will attend to them. Uh, we will try to answer all your questions uh, during the plenary towards the end of this webinar. This webinar will be recorded and the recording will be made available. And uh, actually, you can access uh, at C2's YouTube channel uh, for the recording as well. And you can also visit OSRL's website uh, for, the, for the recording of this webinar. Uh, later on, we will share with you a QR code or the link for you to complete the attendance and the feedback form so towards uh, towards the middle and the end so we will share that now if you if we have a lot of questions and we are not able to answer that in the plenary uh, no worries about that because uh, we will release an online article wherein we will answer those questions uh, that we have missed answering during the plenary right so just to quickly share with you uh, the Zoom functionality. So what's important for you as participants of this webinar is the chat box function. Uh, this is where you're going to write or type in your questions about uh, the topics that we are discussing for today's webinar. And for this webinar today, we have the honor and pleasure to have the resource speakers. Uh, we have Mr. Almerindo Oliviera de Silva, uh, the National Project Coordinator of Timor-Leste, uh, of the UNDP Timor-Leste. Uh, we are also joined by our very own OSRL response manager, Mr. Ali Haider Alatas, who will talk about uh, the net environmental benefit analysis and uh, spill impact mitigation analysis. And it is also our pleasure and honor to have Mr. Johnson Marin, a senior pollution officer from the Papua New Guinea National Maritime Safety Authority. Uh, we, Mr. Marin will share a case study from uh, Papua New Guinea. So to start off this webinar, webinar um, Mon Almer will provide us an overview of the at C2. So uh, Mon Almer, uh, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mon Norman. Uh, and good afternoon, evening, and good morning for everyone uh, around uh, this event or the webinar. So my name is uh, Almerindo Oliveira Silva as the National Project Coordinator, UNDP Timor-Leste. So I will run through this uh, the introduction. Uh, so please, Casey, you can help me for the, uh, the presentation, sharing the slide. Yeah, uh, as you all, you, you know, there's uh, the project overview for this, uh, the Arafura and Timosi system action phase two, or we call it the uh, ATC2. That is uh, since uh, uh, last 2014. Then it's in the, the first phase, then second phase is start on 2019 to 2024. So this is the second of uh, second phase of the GF uh, finance. Even the support program, uh, building foundation results is like uh, realized in the 
first phase 2009 to 2014. So we work in the four country. It is uh, Indonesia, Papua New Guinea, Timor Leste, and uh, Australia as well as observer. Then uh, we the, the implementation of the activity is uh, uh, three uh, uh, three countries. Then one uh, Australia is observer. The main activities we work for is a. Uh, uh, over exploitation of marine resource, uh, loss or, or degradation of the habitats and biodiversity, land and marine basic pollution. That's the one main uh, we, we do in the webinar uh, uh, today. And the climate change. Next, please. Yeah. Uh, the uh, project is, you know, that we have uh, uh, three major components and the nine expected outcome and 23, uh, 23 uh, activities that we need to achieve. So at C2 project, is, uh, we have a component outcomes and output. The component one is a uh, regional and the national local government, uh, local uh, governance for large marine ecosystem management. This is, you have a uh, four point there. The point one is a regional and national mechanism. Uh, second is strengthening institutional and human resource uh, capacity. Third one is a better understanding of the climate change impact. Uh, for the last one is an updated TDA, SAP, and then NAPS. Uh, component two is this improving large marine ecosystem carry, uh, carrying capacity to sustain provisioning, regulating, and support the ecosystem service. Uh, uh, for one is improved management of the fishes and coastal resource of the host fish existing food. Second question that the ICM incorporating climate change adaptation implemented at local level. The component three is the knowledge management. As we have uh, one point here, the improved monitoring of the status of ATS region and uh, this, uh, dissemination of the information. Next, please. Yes. Next, please. Okay, sir. Yeah. I think we have some um, uh, uh, intermittent yes. uh, line with, with, with uh, Mon Almer. Yeah, may I continue, uh, Norman? If yeah, go I... ahead, Kasi. Yeah. Okay, so on. I apologize because, yeah, on behalf of Mon Almer, I will continue the presentation until he can join us again. So uh, we did this regional study uh, with our expert uh, in 2000, uh, between 2020 and 2021. And from the regional assessment, we found out that oil spills and marine deters are two major concerns for the Arafura and Timor Seas region. And uh, from our modeling, we also found out that the southern coast of Timor and Rote Island are the most vulnerable to oil spill incidents. Uh, we will encourage you to read the report, if you're interested, you can uh, scan the QR code here or you can also visit our website. Okay, and and Maung Almer, if you're ready, please jump in. If not, then I will continue. So the so as <laughs> apologize for the technical issues, um, but yeah, as explained by Norman, the webinar objectives is to enable information sharings amongst and also to build capacity of the ATS stakeholders on oil spill preparedness and response, and 
To do so through this webinar, uh, we designed it so that the topics are progressive, uh, starting from awareness of oil spill impacts to understanding of oil spill risk and what it takes to respond to oil spill incident effectively. Um, we also like to introduce some key principles involved in preparing for and responding to oil spill incidents throughout these webinars. So this is just a brief overview of the previous webinar we had. So for the first webinar, uh, it, it was attended by 76 participants from eight countries. Um, and then uh, two of our distinguished speakers from OSRL uh, shared about first the causes and fates of marine oil spills. And second uh, is on the impacts of marine oil spills. And for the Q2 webinar, uh, it was attended by 66 participants from 10 countries. And for the second webinar, uh, our experts uh, first talk about surveillance, modeling, and visualization, uh, what and why of MSV, uh, the available tools, and also a, a case study from Sri Lanka. And then the second speaker uh, talk about the different response strategies, uh, starting from cone of response and the use of dispersion, in situ burning, at sea containment and recovery, recovery devices, and finally the shoreline cleanup. And uh, the second presentation was wrapped uh, with uh, case studies from Indonesia and Sri Lanka. So in this Q3 webinar, uh, as, as stated in the in the e-flyer, uh, our speaker, uh, Mr. Ali Haider Alatas, uh, will share with us about uh, net environmental benefit analysis or NEBA or uh, the spill impact mitigation analysis or SEMA. So in his presentation, we'll hear more about what is NEBA and SEMA and also the process to, uh, to do that. And lastly, as mentioned by Norman, uh, we also will we'll hear from Mr. Johnson Marin on PNG's oil spill case study that, yeah, I trust it will be really interesting. And that is all from us. Uh, thank you, back to you, Norman. Yeah, thanks, Cassie. And uh, thanks, Mon Almer. So uh, we apologize uh, to everyone uh, because of the intermittent uh, internet connection in Timor-Leste. So uh, to continue on, uh, just a quick um, sharing about uh, OSRL. So OSRL is the world's uh, leading global oil spill response specialist since 1985. So we have attended to a lot of spills already. And uh, OSRL is wholly owned um, by most of the environmentally uh, responsible oil and gas and energy companies who actually represents the majority of the global oil production. And we provide global, uh, we're the uh, integrated provider for surface and subsea uh, uh, source control uh, services. So if you're a member, you will have gained access to the full suite uh, of expertise for our response and preparedness on a global basis. So just a quick summary who we are. Uh, we are the largest international industry funded cooperative. Uh, we are owned uh, by major oil and gas production, transportation, and energy companies. And we provide resources to prepare for and respond to oil spills efficiently and effectively on a global uh, basis. So that's oil spill response uh, limited. So I'll be... Uh, uh, I will end my session there, but uh, to all our participants, uh, you can proceed to type in your questions in the chat box as early as now or during the presentation. So again, as I mentioned, do not worry if your questions are not read or not answered today. Uh, or SRL will release an online article after this webinar to answer all the questions that you have that we missed out during the plenary. So without further delay, our first presenter is Ali. Uh, Ali will talk about the NIBA and SEMA. So Ali, uh, the floor is yours. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, uh, I believe everyone can see my screen. Yes, we can see your screen, Ali. Okay, uh, I think it's nice that uh, Cassie have uh, run through uh, the web series that you already went through the webinar, the first, the second one, I think is nicely tied up with the next session that I'll bring about is the uh, net environmental benefit analysis, uh, NIBA and uh, CMA spill in impact mitigation analysis. So, okay. 
So what we like to achieve on this session is to understand the principle of uh, NIBA and SIMA. So what is NIBA and SIMA? This is the two uh, names that we usually hear when we're talking about spill incident, uh, understand the impact of uh, different environment sensitivity, socioeconomic sensitivity. This is the, the norms that we always look when we're talking about uh, looking at environmental impact or socioeconomic impact when there's one spill. Understand the relevancy of SEMA and how it used because this is some this is one of the tools that we believe uh, uh, they can support uh, the to understand the impact and then to assess the situation how we will uh, uh, act in terms of response, what is option the best, and, and that will be the, uh, the best uh, tools right now in terms of one of the tools that we can use for uh, assessing uh, all spill impact. Uh, summarize later, we're going to look at the SEMA process as a whole and understanding from the start how we look at different data and understand. Uh, actually, this is also connected with the previous webinar when we're talking about fate of oil, when we're talking about uh, response option, this is will come up in a later uh, slides that I'm going to talk about. So uh, what is a net environmental benefit analysis? That there's actually a, a video that is actually nicely summarized. It. So this video itself is uh, actually developed by the, the IPCA. So IPCA is the industry corporate uh, organization that is uh, uh, usually in charge to uh, roll out some of the guidelines from the uh, industry best practice. So uh, uh, I will start the video uh, later on. We will discuss a bit more in terms of implementation. We use oil every day and not just in our cars. Ali, the video is on pause. The video is pause, huh? Yeah. We try again, Andrew. This pause. Yeah. I think there's some sort of delay, uh, yeah. perhaps because of the in, uh, internet uh, connection. It's running now. Let me start over again. Sorry, guys. Uh, Apologize. We use oil every day, and not just in our cars. And as the And as this resource is delivered through the oil supply chain, we have to work together to protect our shared values. Shared values such as sensitive ecosystems, local businesses, health and safety, tourism and recreation, and regional industries. The best scenario is to never have a spill. In the event that a spill occurs, there is a process in place to minimize impact to the environment and the community. How can we work together to proactively protect our shared values before an event occurs? The key to minimizing the impact of a spill is to respond quickly, 
by carefully pre-selecting response tools before an incident. We have a navigational guide for selecting the right response tool. We use four steps to evaluate four factors. We first look at effectiveness. Which tool will remove the most oil? We also evaluate feasibility. Which tool can be physically and safely executed? Understanding the effectiveness and feasibility of response options, we then consider the specific environmental sensitivities and the community impacts. We use the Net Environmental Benefit Analysis to determine which tool will minimize impact on the environment and the community. After understanding the effectiveness, feasibility, and environmental and social impacts, we then determine if the response options we've selected comply with regulations. Today we're going to talk about the work we do to evaluate the environmental and social or community impacts of oil spill response. Net Environmental Benefit Analysis, or NEBA, is a process used by the response community for making the best choices to minimize impacts of oil spills on people and the environment. Before a spill occurs, NEBA requires the identification and prioritization of environmental and community assets based upon environmental sensitivities and social values. Outcomes are predicted by reviewing and comparing previous spill cases, including restoration considerations, to understand potential impacts. During the NEBA process, environmental and social impacts are a way to determine effective oil spill response tools and balance trade-offs. NEBA also establishes plans and puts pre-approvals in place to support environmental and social values. NEBA or the Net Environmental Benefit Analysis allows proactive pre-selection and planning to inform a response. This improves organization, communication with the community, and plays a critical role in protecting the environment. Help us in achieving our goal of a rapid and unified response by partnering with us before a spill, participating in conversations with industry on a regular basis, joining us for drills and exercises in your community, and supporting efforts to put plans and pre-approvals in place before a spill. Through effective preparation, we can create a quicker and more efficient response together. Protecting the environment requires a speedy response. NEBA makes that possible. Okay, uh, uh, that is uh, the video. So later on, I will just summarize. Uh, it's actually the presentation. We'll actually look at the video in terms of the four stages, evaluate data, predict the outcome, uh, balance threat off, and then which one is, is uh, feasible in terms of uh, looking at different response options. Okay. Pause this one, sorry. Yeah. So what is net environmental benefit analysis? So it's aimed to decrease the overall effect of an oil on the environmental and socioeconomic resources while achieving acceptable standard of a cleanup. Because in the end, what we want to achieve is when we're doing spill response is we want to minimize the impact to the environment, the impact to the social economy. And this is actually what we want to achieve by looking at the impact itself, uh, look at the response option that we have, different toolkits, I mean, uh, Cassie did brought up, we did the webinar before we're talking about different toolkits, SC container recovery, dispersants, uh, in-situ burning. This is all the toolkits that we, we, we're going to see. And, and this toolkit actually help you to minimize the environmental impact to any of uh, uh, environmental sensitivity or social economy. So benefit versus damage of, of cleanup. Again, uh, it, it's something that uh, we all, always want to see. Uh, when we choose any action, uh, we always want to see is there any positive outcome or negative outcome. We don't want to do more in the quick damage, or we also don't want to choose the wrong uh, tool.
tools that is inside the, uh, the toolkits. And as well, look at the advantages versus the advantages of different speed response options versus natural recovery, because possibly leaving it to the environment by doing other thing in the response toolkits, which is there's other process in terms of response that probably people see is nothing. For example, like we while we're talking about surveillance, modeling, visualization, although we are not doing most tasks uh, and hands-on to bring equipment, but probably this is the, the best option to go with. For example, if they're spilling mangrove area, the oil sort of impact the mangrove. So probably some, if we go inside with a big equipment, big machinery, it will damage the ecosystem of mangrove itself. So this is some evidence to look at this advantage of this threat versus advantages of different toolkits or against natural recovery as well. So which option to choose? So this is where NIBA and later on SEMA as a tool will help us to look on the toolkits that we have and from the impact that we gather from the data, we will definitely have a better option to choose which more efficient, which have a lesser impact to the environment, which actually have more benefit, more positive outcome and so on. So uh, spill impact mitigation analysis. So this is what we call a SEMA. So again, NIBA is the concept. So uh, SEMA sometimes uh, is, is more in terms of the tools itself because this concept look nice uh, is, uh, in terms of uh, looking at the uh, environment, but NIBA also doesn't look uh, nice in terms of perception because the associate of the word benefit because in the end, if there's a spill, we don't see actually any benefit to the environment. We always see that there's always negative uh, outcome in, in state to the environment. So there's a there's a bad perception when we look at, at NIBA as well. And how to look at, uh, how to get all the stakeholders involved because when we're talking about NIBA or SEMA, this is where at the time we gather different stakeholders, different experts when you're talking about uh, different environment sensitivity. For example, if, if we have all spill impacted mangrove, then we're gonna talk with the, uh, people that actually have uh, knowledge specialized in mangrove uh, ecosystem and so on to understand what are the better way uh, in terms of uh, clean up the mangrove and so on. So uh, something that we, we might have a, have a better knowledge and we can uh, wrap up in a nice way in terms of looking at advantage and advantage. Again, the principle unchanged, what we want is we want to see how the spill impact is mitigated using the different response toolkits. And again, looking at the data, looking at the response toolkit, feasible outcome, predict the outcome, again, choose uh, the better option. So what gardens material there? So actually this is something that was developed by the industry itself, by IPCA. So IPCA working with different organization uh, as well with, with All Spill Response Limited, our company, we have several people that writing and the guidance. So it started by, by, by NIBA choosing Spill Response. It was uh, published in 2000, but later on retired because we, we published an, a new edition with 2015, talking about response strategy, looking at uh, using NIBA. And then we come up 2017 uh, just to have a, a, a better aspect on looking at NIBA because NIBA is still uh, a concept a principle, but SEMA is more uh, a methodology to carrying out NIBA. So in, in a better way, it's, it's just a tool, it's one of the tools to achieve net environment benefit analysis, looking at uh, how the outcome of response, which is advantage or disadvantage using a response option. So again, principle of NIBA and SEMA, facilitate transparency and stakeholder involvement. Again, uh, I think the video did mention to us, uh, this is the, uh, the time where we get a lot of people. Actually, when we're talking about NIBA or SEMA, the best time to do it is during a peace time. So when we do it, when it still happen, it's actually, it's a bit, it, it, it's, it's not wrong to use it when, when you have an incident, but it's just better when you have time, when you look at the environmental impact, when you want to uh, start your operation, when you want to prepare your hospital contingency plan. So this is actually the best way to, to have NIBA because you need to have a, a very uh, nice conversation between all the stakeholders involved. Like uh, the, probably if talking to socioeconomic, you need to talk with the uh, fishermen, uh, fishing village, head of fishermen. So this is something that probably we need to, to a bit uh, prepare in terms of, that's why I'm saying that the, the the time to do it is probably in peacetime. Target larger and higher consequence of all spill, okay, because it's not 
only looking at the environment. We're talking about socioeconomic. We're talking about economic loss. We're talking about uh, different uh, area that is quite sensitive to a country or to an area as well. Again, to promote full response toolkit, not just for this person. Although when we talk about later on, we look at sigma calculation, it seems like this person is always uh, an, an option to go, but it depends on the scenario because if the incident happened in Nishore where you have a shallow water, then of course this person is something that uh, it will bring a, a more a negative outcome. Will In the end, when you do sigma, you will, you will actually have a less efficient as well. Uh, integrate ecological and socio-economic culture and consideration as well, uh, because beside the ecological impact, you will have uh, uh, socio-economic people that are living there will probably lose their livelihood if they have some area where they do fishing and so on. And also cultural consideration. That's all we talk about uh, where SEMA uh, look at different cultures. So if you have sacred temple or you have any uh, location that we believe uh, by the inhabitants or by the local people that is something that is uh, pressure for them or, or, or for the religion as well. Uh, so SEMA process is start again, again, looking back, I think this is something that we saw in the video. So this is the four stages that we look at. So the first one is evaluate data. So actually, if you go through the webinar again, I, I will bring up a lot of uh, webinar that uh, the Etsy team did. So it's actually have the same stages where stages one you look at what all oil fate you took about talking about resource at risk and then stage two talking about predict the outcome what is the impact of the environment uh, what is the prediction uh, of the oil you can use modeling you can use visualization or and then balance straight off look at uh, dialogue to key stakeholders the total impact mitigation score and ranking for each response option is degree so SEMA actually in a way helping us using NIBA but having a better option to look at the qualitative side because some uh, point in the NIBA, if you talk about subjective, people will say uh, in, in more subjective, a bit hard, but in, in SEMA is helping the process to be qualitative uh, and quantitative. So probably people can see the scoring and the vision as well. And of course, the stage four is select the best option using the process. Later, we're gonna discuss, we're gonna see what actually option is feasible on that scenario as well. So, for example, here we just uh, have a, a, a nice uh, sample of. Uh, sorry, okay. I think I'm a bit too fast. Okay, so this is an example uh, for spill scenario. So, for example, we have a spill, and this is the, the, the area of the map on your on the right side. You can see the area of the map. There's a spill, which is the point one. Uh, it's a crude oil. So, you can see it's not light, but it's also a bit medium, medium to light oil. So it's from faster pollution. This, of course, you can see for the map, the map itself, there's a lot of uh, sensitivity area there. It's not only uh, talking about economic, uh, uh, ecological, you're not talking about uh, the, the, the environment as well, but we're talking about socioeconomic, uh, like fishing area, uh, industrial water, response base, and so on. So the volume was spill just for estimate 1,000 tons. So this one, later on, we're going to discuss how we use SEMA as stages to look at the uh, uh, how we will uh, try to respond to this type of spill uh, that we have using a, a, a SEMA stages. So if we have that kind of scale, what we're going to do first is evaluate the data. What is uh, the credible potential uh, release scenario? Okay, we're talking about 1,000 tons, but sometimes probably not, not 1,000 tons. Uh, uh, it, it will be not like a instantaneous release, which is you have 1,000 tons straight away. Okay, you will need to look how you can evaluate that data. One of the things we, we can do, we can do a, a one of the things in the response toolkit of response, you can do modeling, you can do trajectory, all fate and trajectory modeling to look where the spill moving. Is it going to a uh, more uh, sensitivity area where you have uh, impacted the economy or the ecological as well? And as well to uh, determine the resource at risk. Looking on the map earlier, probably you can see there's different resource at risk. You can see fishing village, you can see industrial water tag, as you see response bases, you see color relief, and so on. So by evaluating data, we know what uh, the spill can impact it to. So, like I mentioned, evaluate data. Uh, what the scenario choose? Okay, we did talk about scenario. What is the environmental setting? Looking at the map, what are the uh, possible uh, resources at risk? 
uh, identify what are the data, ecological, socioeconomic, for example, if, uh, if near sandy beaches, is this where the, the uh, seasonal uh, turtle ne nesting and so on? This is something that probably we will try to engage the local authority, Department of Environment, or the, probably this is something that the, uh, if, uh, um, if we're talking about spill incident that caused by uh, oil and gas industry, they'll probably have the, this information on their oil spill contingency plan or their ESI, Environmental Susceptibility Index, when they are uh, doing their own production. So uh, after looking at the data itself, then we, we can come up, okay, look like if the spill heading to shoreline in, in 12 or 14 hours ahead, then probably we can think of probably we need to, to look at uh, different uh, uh, response toolkit. We can look at uh, this person. In, in the end, we want to try to minimize the oil impacted the shoreline probably. We can use this person. We can do containment recovery. When I say containment recovery, it's a simple way. You deploy a boom, uh, which is going to contain the oil in the water. Then you're going to deploy schema. So you're going to scheme as well. So make sure we are trying to use all the toolkit that we have that is available. So we can actually uh, choose uh, an efficient one, India will not might choose one. We probably need to combine several response options. I think if we're talking about uh, earlier webinar, I think Cassie talking response con. So response con actually how we can use all the different response toolkit by try to uh, put it in, in, in a way for location wise, like near to incident area, you can use containment recovery, you can use boom to contain the oil, then the schema, then after that, you can use your, your, your this person and closer to the shoreline, you can use your shoreline response as well. So going back to scenario, it's a group top two oil, it's a thousand ton. Of course, looking at the map, we know the resources at risk, there's a Schoberg colony. So you can see here, uh, the, the modeling is heading to the, uh, west area, the uh, island, which is having important shorebird sor colony, fishing area, and mangrove. And the response option that probably you can think about just for the scenario is like containment recovery, surface dispersion, and in-situ burning. So this option later on, we're going to use SEMA in terms of a qualitative process. So as to that, predict the outcome. So actually, what is the outcome if the oil hit the uh, these resources that we are only talking about, like the uh, the, uh, the shoreboard colony and, and the fishing area. So what is the outcome? So after that, we will understand what will be the outcome to the, to the sensitivity of our environment and socioeconomic as well. So what we do usually, before we uh, go back to the uh, uh, drawing board in terms of uh, uh, looking uh, at the predicted outcome, we need to set the baseline. So the baseline will be no intervention. So when we talk not, no intervention, we not actually uh, we, we actually try not to do anything. We, we will look at how natural recover and how's the, the impact when there's, there's nothing in place. Uh, this will give in an impact mitigation score and against the resource categories. And then identify potential at sea response option for specific area. Again, typical potential response option as well. Uh, no intervention will be your baseline. Or you were talking about natural recovery, then you have on water containment recovery, subsea dispersion injection. If it is a, a subsea blowout case, for example, uh, the BP Mokando uh, uh, in 2010 incident, that, that's probably one of the uh, response option that they did as well, uh, subsea dispersion injection. Uh, surface dispersion application uh, using vessel or aircraft. Uh, control in-situ burning and shoreline booming, especially if we know that uh, the oil will impact the shoreline uh, in, 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 in a short time. So, so using the resource compartment, we know the, uh, the location of the oil, of course, uh, when the oil spill, you're gonna definitely hit the water surface. When you're talking water surface, it's definitely something that is high impact, okay? So it's high impact, the score is, is, is four. And then you, you're talking water column, usually the oil will disperse to the water column, about uh, 10 meters under water column, of course, there will be yeah, impact as well. Uh, and then we assess uh, different resource as well. You can see when we're talking about relative impact uh, score one, which is no, no in, significant for socioeconomic. Uh, if there's no intervention, it's a bit low, low impact. Uh, I guess, again, it determine, okay, how you determine the scoring, actually, this is where you need to discuss together with different stakeholders, different expertise, local agency, 
uh, people that are actually going to affect it uh, on the on the oil spill itself. So again, this is something that we need to discuss together uh, uh, when we actually do the qualitative uh, scoring. So this is where the drilling intervention lies. So we can see water surface, the impact's quite high, the score is four. So later the scoring will help us look at the total score for different response option. So this is the response option that we, we choose, containment recovery, surface dispersion, in-situ burning, and shoreline booming. So this is just an example. So in real life, you will have more uh, response option that you can use, of course, uh, using the, the, the guideline that is set by uh, OSPI response and how, how, we will, how we advise you from our technical advisory point of view. So the determining resource compartment, you see that we, we just discussed uh, there on the table, you see there's a water column, water service, air, shorelines, uh, high value resources. You determine it by the data that you got earlier. So where's the spill is? Is the spill gonna impact any shoreline, socioeconomy, culture? Then you will write down the resource compartment nicely as a comparative starting for no intervention. Again, it is important when carrying out the SIMA to only select the resource subcategory applicable to the situation. Uh, okay, for example, it's far offshore, it's like uh, probably 100 kilometers from, from shoreline. Of course, you cannot use shoreline as your uh, water column, uh, as your uh, resource compartment, because in the end, based on the modeling, uh, you want to reach shoreline as well, then you, you, you should not use it. So again, try to, to adjust uh, where uh, is, uh, you can use the different compartment as well. So just for a big discussion, we're talking about different resource compartment. What is water column? So usually water column is upper three to five meter of water column from, from surface uh, spills. So for subsea release, of course, the water column will be from, from the below uh, the vicinity of the oil plant. Uh, the degree to, uh, so when talking about relative impact, usually uh, this is something that we, we, we took from the uh, 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 good practice they developed by, by IP. So degree to which species residing in the water column are impacted on the dissolved concentration and toxicity of oil. So again, uh, what are the um, ecological that living there and what would be the, the impact to them, for example. So water surface, of course, we understand you have a lot of biota that live in water surface, seabird, marine mammals, and so on. So the relative impact might be a bit uh, a bit higher. So it will cover uh, potential uh, signal numbers. So usually quite high relative impact. Uh, it's very rare that you put low relative impact uh, when talking water surface because it's, it's definitely normally where all the living things or biota living uh, in, in the water surface. So, but again, it also might seem the water column. Again, this is something, again, I did uh, discussing is something that we need to talk together with different stakeholders and different experts. A uh, shoreline, of course, uh, there were always a present of ecological habitat particles. Uh, they are vulnerable and valuable to oil. We have uh, sometimes some different shoreline, different country. That's where uh, seasonal shelter nesting, and you can see that it's very important to different uh, uh, habitat and biota as well. Uh, degree and extent extent of oil uh, again. When what we want, we, what we always try to advocate is we don't want the spill reach shoreline because when the spill reach shoreline, the impact is going to be so big. And and uh, again, if you if you uh, talk about oil fate, uh, because when you spill, uh, for example, a thousand ton of oil, the the one that can impact the shoreline maybe can be uh, ten times of it, for example, because again, oil is spreading, fragmented, just how we discuss when we're talking about oil fate. But again, it will depend on the type of shoreline as well. We're talking about shandy shoreline where there's limited uh, biological abundance and productivity, low probably low relative impact. And then exposed rocky shoreline. Again, this is a quite high productive area where you have a lot of uh, high wave energy. So it probably have a low uh, relative impact as well. A shelter shoreline where actually you have a lot of uh, uh, habitat living there and probably can definitely warrant a high relative impact as well. Socioeconomic, again, we, we did talk about shoreline. Of course, shoreline have a different uh, type. You have sandy, you have rocky. But of course, if, if that sandy shoreline, you have uh, people that are living there, people that is uh, now uh, uh, having the, the, the living who actually attached to that. And then we're talking about a different type of socioeconomic. We have commercial, recreational, tourism, water sport, commercial shipping, and water intakes. Uh, again, how you look in terms of relative impact, you will definitely look at the financial losses. 
uh, especially you know talking about tourism fishing of course some people that is a, uh, this is a, a I can say very sensitive subject to some people because of course some people will probably uh, 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 depend on on this uh, 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 sensitivity area so again uh, especially also for water impacts if the the local population actually have a have a dependency on the local impact and can be uh, uh, put as a high relative impact as well. Uh, culture, I, I guess this is something that we uh, commonly have in, especially in, in our Asian culture. I, I guess people are, are, are known quite uh, uh, respect to the sacred land, ancient building and artifact as well. So again, uh, the relative impact of this location will be depend on the degree and the extent of uh, uh, exposure of oiling. And of course, need to discuss with the people that is having uh, expert and the stakeholder that is involved as well. So we did discuss about credit outcome no intervention. So again, uh, this is just for example, for seabed area, you, you're talking about one, uh, because uh, really an oil can go down to the seabed, except there is a very shallow water as well. So usually oil, in, in, in when you talk about oil freight, usually will disperse between uh, 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 10 meters below uh, surface water or 20 meters uh, below surface water as well. Yeah. So again, relative impact one uh, is saying, uh, uh, sorry, this bit last time. So one is no insignificant impact will be one, uh, and then low impact will be two, uh, medium impact will be three. For example, we put here uh, shoreline mangrove. Of course, if we identify the oil, the hit mangrove, it is something that we believe a high impact because uh, we know mangrove is quite uh, important in terms of our life, not only uh, for people that are living there, not only for ecosystem, but I think mangrove is one of the, uh, uh, the root of the essence of, of, of a shoreline sometimes. And then we're talking about balance trade-off. We're looking at the response option. We do have response option and we already have some data for no intervention. Again, uh, uh, going back the uh, the scenario we're talking about, there's a seabed, uh, then you use the no intervention. And then you for the response option itself, it will be different. You, you use impact modification, modifications as uh, uh, a factor. So like we say, environmental setting, resource sensitivity, resource option, effectiveness, this have to be in a dialogue. Like I did mention before, it's always uh, the base time to do NIBA or CIMA is always on the peace time because when there's a uh, spill incident, it's very tough to gather all the uh, stakeholder and, and to have a, 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 a valuable discussion. So uh, it, again, this, this discussion also gonna look at the determined impact modification factor for each resource compartment and option. So this one will be for every uh, type of uh, uh, response option. You can see that uh, we block uh, why the subsidy is present because probably this is something that is not related to where blow out. So this is some response option that we feel that is not feasible for surface option. So the cut to calculate the impact mitigation response for each resource compartment and option, uh, then you will have the, the scoring. So, so to, to calculate it, then you will uh, use the intervention uh, and time the impact modification uh, factor, then you will have the relative impact mitigation score. So for example, using uh, 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 no intervention for water surface, uh, the impact might be medium. Uh, and then if you use containment recovery uh, in terms of uh, positive, it, it quite positive can be one, uh, quite high, then the result will be three. So again, impact modification factor. So it's a bit different for relative impact. So the impact modification factor is actually to, to score the response option, how it, it, it helped in terms of uh, minimize the, the, uh, the negative impact of oil spill. Uh, for example, score three will be major mitigation of impact. If you use this response toolkit, you can manage to, uh, I'm not saying make the oil disappear, but at least reduce the concentration of oil in the water, then you can, of course, uh, reduce the impact to, to, the, uh, to the environment like ecological as well. So the, the, the score is given for each response technique in correlation with each resource as well. So we're going by the resource and then we're going by the response option as well. 
So for surface water oil spill, again, for example, I think the, the example that we showed earlier is a uh, surface water oil spill uh, from uh, pressure pollution. So you can see that the first stage will be no intervention. Uh, so no intervention is using potential relative impact. Uh, what will be the impact, high relative impact? And then you're going to use the impact modification factor for different uh, containment, sorry, uh, con uh, response option. So after do the calculation, so again, uh, looking at different impact uh, uh, modification factor for containment recovery, for example, we can take uh, uh, shoreline mangrove. So if you're talking about shoreline mangrove, you don't do any intervention, then the impact to the environment probably high. But how about if you do uh, containment recovery? Okay, there's probably positive pos positive impact is a minor mitigation impact is it, slightly positive. So you can uh, put one, then the relative impact will be uh, um, potential relative impact time the impact modification factor, then it will be four. And we, if you're talking about other things, for example, if we choose in-situ burning, then uh, for example, for some uh, different compartment, uh, okay, go back to in situ burning. If we choose in situ burning for the mangrove compartment, when we do in situ burning, then probably we only have small residue of oil. So it's only going to impact uh, a small uh, area of mangrove. So the, the impact modification factor can be big, can be three. So you can see three times four will be uh, 12. So stage four is uh, looking at the best option from different uh, uh, response option that we look at earlier from the no intervention to the response option. So uh, predict the outcome. So look at the, uh, so when we're talking about evaluate that, uh, then we, when we predict the outcome, you use the baseline, which is the, the no intervention. Look at the resource compartment based on the information that we have, environmental sensitivity, socioeconomic sensitivity, and then we will look at impact modification factor and so on. So this is actually, uh, later, uh, I think Norman will share you the, the reference that we have uh, from the IP card. So this, you can access the information from the uh, IP card best factor for the spilling uh, impact mitigation score as well. So again, the first stage is break the outcome. The uh, third stage is balance trade off. And the, the fifth stage is total impact to the uh, mitigation score. So uh, look at this. You can see uh, the, the highest... Uh, efficient or scoring will be uh, this person. Again, probably this person is the best because uh, it will help the oil to break down uh, into water column and will be eat by micronic agonism and in the end, it will help uh, reducing the impact to the shoreline as well. But not always the case that this person will be the number one option. But again, we do not say that we're going to use this person only, but we always nice to have all the toolkits that we have. That's why we uh, did advise how we use the response con in terms of using different response option at different uh, stages of response. So no intervention. So this is the effectiveness of response uh, by using uh, the scoring from the no intervention and, and using different of response option. So the, the score for each response option are the then total the base of metric for each response option. So that will be the uh, uh, the high total score that we're going to see for, for everything. So using uh, all the resource compartment. Again, four is where you select the best option. So I think that, that's where SEMA actually help a lot in terms of NIBA. So it's actually give a, a better uh, qualitative, especially when we talk about uh, when we talk about different uh, decision response option and we need to justify this uh, and SEMA will definitely help. So key takeaway, uh, I believe I did introduce what is the principle of NIBA and SEMA. In the end, what we want to achieve is making sure that the action that we take actually uh, help to achieve our objective, which is when talking about all response, the objective is always to minimize the impact to the environment, uh, minimize impact to the social economy because of people that are living there. Again, understand the relevancy of SEMA. So SEMA, again, this is methodology that's going to help uh, NIBA in terms of uh, making justification, making us uh, uh, do the correct step when we're talking res response option. And again, I believe we went through the process for stage one to stage four in terms of how we use SEMA 
Uh, it will be uh, uh, by qualitative scoring using the relative impact for no intervention, then impact modification factor for the salt option. So I, I believe this is nicely round up uh, what we use of SEMA. Uh, if there's any question, uh, I believe uh, uh, later on, uh, Norman will uh, uh, help to facilitate on the plenary hall. Thank you, everyone. Yeah, thanks, Ali. Uh, that's a good presentation. <clears throat> um, again, to our participants, uh, if you have questions, please do type that in your chat box. Uh, but I do have one question with you, Ali, uh, with regards to your example. So your example, you calculated some numbers and then you rank them from one to four. Um, yes. Does that mean that um, if, if I'm one of the decision maker, um, do I always or can I choose just the the ranking one or could I use combination of it? I mean, I could use say one to three or I could use the first and second top uh, response options or I'm just constrained to using the 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 first or the the the, the number one response option. What is your take on that? Uh, again, I did the. Uh... A space uh, echo this quite nicely. I mean, uh, the idea of this is just helping to look at the effectiveness when using it. I think we need to be smart. I think if you use it properly in different stages, I think it, different response toolkit can, can help you. I did mention if we draw back again to the response con, when we're talking response con, actually for some uh, mechanical recovery that we use, usually we're going to advise them near the source of spill. So it definitely can help uh, make the all speed spreading. So actually, uh, it's not about looking at the right ranking, but the ranking gonna definitely help you in terms of efficiency. But our suggestion is always try to use different combination or response right. to kit, placing it uh, at the location where we feel there is definitely have efficient result on mm -hmm. one. So basically, Ali, what you're saying is that the ranking provides me an indication how effective it is. Yes, but definitely I could still use combination of the response options. So I'm not just constrained to the most effective. I could still use combination of it, depending again, depending on on the situation. Yes, correct. Norman, you just nicely summarized the. All answer. right, thank you. Right, so uh, thank you, Ali. We will be having you again later for the plenary. So for our participants, uh, again, I would like to. Uh, encourage you to ask questions and I will uh, uh, quickly share this uh, my screen uh, just to show you that we have our attendance and feedback form so the there's a link that was shared to you in the chat box so please uh, click that so that we will know whether you would like to have uh, a certificate so that uh, feedback form will also ask whether you would like a certificate for this uh, webinar. Uh, if you are not able to click that uh, uh, that link, uh, please refer to the to your screen. There's also a QR code which you can scan uh, that will lead you to the attendance and feedback form as well. So thank you for that. Uh, and then the next speaker uh, that we have is uh, one of our good friend uh, from Papua New Guinea, uh, Mr. Johnson Marin. Uh, Johnson will, uh, is the Senior Pollution Officer in National Maritime Safety Administration of Papua New Guinea. So uh, Johnson will be sharing uh, an interesting case study uh, with regards to a spill that happened in Papua New Guinea. So uh, Johnson, my good man, uh, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you, uh, Norman. Uh, you can uh, see me? Yeah, definitely can see you. Okay. Good afternoon. Uh, good evening. All our participants, speakers, and uh, friends who are now uh, watching or listening in uh, to the webinar this afternoon. Uh, my name is uh, Johnson uh, Marin. I'm the uh, Senior Policy Inspector with the National Maritime Safety Authority of Papua New Guinea. Uh, basically, uh, this afternoon, I will be presenting a case study on the uh, oil, palm oil spill 
that happened at the beginning of this year, which was in uh, May, 15th of May, in one of the uh, northern provinces of Papua New Guinea. Later on, I can give you a, a view of where this uh, oil actually uh, took place. Uh, you may be wondering, uh, talking about palm oil, and uh, you are thinking, oil spill, what is it going to do with palm oil? But of course, uh, characteristics are different. Uh, but uh, you are seeing it as a spill, you, you can attend, attend to it uh, using the same techniques. Okay, this is the uh, case study of the palm oil uh, spill in Papua New Guinea. Moving uh, forward to my second slide, it's just the uh, overview of the actual uh, location or place where the oil has uh, spilled. Uh, you can see all the tanks. These are all the uh, reservoirs, the storage facility for the uh, crude oil, crude palm oil. Uh, so let's assume that all those tanks are full at these states, and you just imagine if all of them happen to spill the crude palm oil onto the sea, then that's going to be another natural disaster, I guess. Okay, uh, the spill location you can see on the uh, Google Google map there. Um, the blue, if you can uh, see from wherever you are, there should be a blue circle. That is the location from the tank, the, the reservoirs that I showed you previously, and the red marking along the coastline westward is the, the approximate uh, distance where the crude has uh, drifted during the spill. So it kind of almost four kilometers west along the local community from the spill uh, initial spill location westward. Okay, uh, this is the, the uh, geographical map of Papua New Guinea. Papua New Guinea, as you said, as you know, we are made up of so many uh, little underlying islands. So the red here is basically where the New Britain Island is. The New Britain Island is, uh, is consisted of uh, two provinces, east being on the east, New Britain and west on the West New Britain uh, part, that's where the oil, uh, uh, New Britain palm oil is. So this is the location where, and imagine if we had to respond, NMSA head office will be here, here, here in Port Moresby. And of course, uh, we have other uh, offices also in uh, provinces, other provinces in Ley, uh, Medang, WeWork, Vanimo is the closest town to Indonesia, and uh, Rabaul on the east. That's where the office of the National Maritime Safety Authority is currently located. Of course, in uh, Alatau, the most southern tip here in Milan Bay, and Mosby, of course, is the main office of the National Maritime and Safety Authority. Uh, just for your information, uh, National Maritime Safety Authority is the uh, competent authority uh, going under the law to protect uh, activities in the marine environment and the five elements of the pollution at sea. So it is an authority uh, mandated by law to uh, oversee activities that happen on, uh, on and within the marine environment and the exclusive 200 nautical miles of our uh, national waters. Okay, this slide uh, basically is, is a source of spill. You can see up here the type of oil. As I said earlier, it's a crude palm oil. A source of spill from the storage tank uh, valve failure that was unsecured uh, during the uh, process of loading the export tankers and let's assume to be a man-made uh, error uh, there was no lookout at the time so it was anticipated between 2 and 3 a.m on the 15th of may this year 2022 one of the tanks which was discharging or 
uh, oil from the facility to the loading vessel leaked out. Uh, they were estimated uh, 50 metric ton or 50,000 ton of crude palm oil was uh, actually leaked out to sea through the drainage system within the uh, facility. And uh, the tank itself uh, contained about, capacity is about 150 uh, metric ton. 50 of the metric ton was uh, considered a spillage. And it was discovered at 0500 hours the following morning. By then, uh, the message was already out to responsible agencies. And of course, uh, National Maritime Safety Authority, we've got a sets and rescue as our 24 seven uh, watch. They received this information and eventually the Iraq of the organization NMSA was advised. And the Maritime Environment Protection Department, the team consisted of the manager and the officers departed on the Monday of the same uh, weekend, they flew over to uh, Kimbe to oversee the uh, spill containment activity. Okay, this was basically the assessment made during the uh, uh, during the spill. It was assumed that fifty thousand uh, tons of crude palm oil uh, into the drainage from the unsecured valve to the drainage, and sub subsequently. Uh, it was uh, discovered in the early hours of the morning. Uh, the estimated estimated the spill happened between uh, zero to hundred and three hundred, but as I said earlier, it was discovered uh, discovered about uh, five o'clock in the morning. Upon uh, delivery, the unsecured valve was closed. It was taken care of, and uh, unfortunately, uh, the fifty thousand. Uh, crude oil was already out at sea and uh, floating westward, westward towards the local uh, surrounding villages. Still in the assessment, as I said, uh, the spill moved towards the west part of the, uh, the location. See the red trail there, that is where the spill has actually moved uh, that far uh, during the prevailing condition. The oil was observed to be very viscous that the lumps of water was uh, lumps were on uh, floating on the sea surface. And uh, you can imagine uh, seeing the crude oil, natural crude oil, and uh, vegetable oil and palm oil. Oil palm is one of, uh, they, they uh, kind of have the same, uh, what do, what what's the best word I can describe here? We, we see oil float on the water. Of course, uh, the palm oil was floating on the water, but it was in a uh, close intact lumps, thicker, and it was much easier for uh, recovery purposes. And uh, basically, it was from the natural uh, plant, so there wasn't too much of arm or dangers involved. You can uh, see better later on on the slides, but what of the health occupation of people have to advise the locals and the children about the uh, safety of uh, their well-being. So this is the uh, responses. The responsible party, which is the uh, the source, spillage source, the personals, of course, uh, they were trained and they were able to, they, they were the first respondent, but they were able to contain, uh, contain the, did the containment and recovery. I'll just read a little note here from what they get it. Uh, NMSA and uh, concerned uh, stakeholders have uh, conducted health, safety environment and social impact awareness uh, campaign along the uh, coastal uh, villages. So, in the meantime, when the, the parties, the responsible parties, trained personals were HNS personals were talking to the coastals, NMSA team arrived. NMSA team arrived on a Monday. Uh, they 
supported by doing uh, observing the clean cleanup around the coastline and carrying out awareness to locals, issued end gloves, absorbent pads, and some uh, absorbent booms. But all in all, most of the uh, booms and uh, tanks, whatever was provided by the uh, the consent party. Uh, some of this help that NMSA has provided was uh, the refreshment of uh, water, H2O to the locals and to people who are assisting during the uh, actual cleanup of the oil. Okay, from here you can see this is some of the equipment NMSA has uh, supplied to the locals during the oil spill uh, response, palm oil spill response. From the, uh, the background here, there's one of the uh, tankers uh, used to pump back the uh, spillage into these tanks. The guys in the blue are NMS officers from Port Moresby. And uh, we have HSC personnel from the local company and locals, surrounding locals. Okay. The health and safety awareness included uh, moved, they moved the kids away from the spill area and they also reminded the locals not to reuse or reuse the crude oil that has been uh, uh, removed or contact, collected from the sea as this might cause uh, some hazard, health hazard to the locals. So that's when they uh, told them not to use this oil for cooking or anything. They happened to, uh, after the oil, after cleanup, they asked everyone to do a proper uh, wash down cleanup because of the potential of the skin rashes and uh, irritation. And they also advised uh, locals and those who assisted during the cleanup not to bring any naked lights, especially the uh, light matches that can cause ignition and that could uh, trigger off. A fire and that's not a disaster that we don't want to attend to during the spill itself. Okay, this is the uh, response containment, containment, and uh, containment and recovery process. These are the booms that were deployed during the spill and contain all these yellowish. Uh, crude palm oil, they will contain using the boom, light booms. Uh, this was all done by the response team from the NBPOL. Uh, on arrival, the officers from NMSA were so, so uh, amazed to see how quick uh, this containment was. So, Later on in uh, some of one of us, one or two of our slides, you can see it did not take more than a week or so for uh, the containment and the recovery uh, process. It's like uh, putting us taking the lid of the sink and all the water run off in no time at all. So that was uh, one thing, and I open also for the uh, organization NMSA and also uh, for the. Uh, the company itself that the spill actually occurred. Uh, these are more pictures. You're looking back uh, that wharf, uh, that's where these tankers, they come in, oil tankers, they come in to pump out all the uh, crude palm oil from the tanks that I saw earlier. And so this is the vessel that was actually doing the loading for export when uh, when one of those uh, valves was not physically uh, tightened, whatever, looked at, so that's where, how the leak came about, and um, we have a spill. So these are some of the oil that's been contained in the, in the boom, the light boom, and the locals are queuing up to uh, capture them and put them in those tanks. Hose running from one of the uh, wheelie bin, pumping or sucking out the oil and onto the tanks, portable tanks that are on the sand. 
Okay, during the response containment recovery, you find that oil and gas companies in the area, they provide their own oil spill uh, response equipment. Uh, this is also one of the uh, things that NMSA uh, enforces for any oil gas companies who, have, uh, who are in, in the country, they would have a site plan, contingency plan. So we have officers in the monitoring department, they carry out inspections yearly, six monthly, quarterly, ensuring that the contingency plans are updated. And that was one of the uh, part where the, the organization, the company responsible had is trained personnel and the booms readily available for such incidences. And that was the action that they took to contain uh, the palm, crude palm oil rapidly and on time. Okay, so this is the date on the 16th of May. They, uh, you can see from here, some of the crude palm oil that has drifted along the shoreline line westward, that has, most of them have been contained within the, uh, within the source area, but whatever uh, remaining was, you can see here. On the uh, 17th, the following day, this is how the beach looked like. So from 16, after the containment and remainder of the oil on the beach front, so line, and this is what you see on the 17th, the following day, all this oil, whatever, were all cleaned up by locals and the uh, respondents who attended the spill. So it may be, it, it could be different from uh, oil gas, the natural oil that we for diesel fuel. It, it may be, it would have been a different scenario altogether. But because it's harm, not uh, that harmful, uh, communities were using all other containment means from house dishes to bucket. Uh, they were not uh, really uh, waiting for any sophisticated equipment that, that can be deployed to get rid of oil. So this is what happened uh, with the locals to assist in cleaning up the, their shoreline, line. And that's how far they've gone the following day to clean the entire shore, uh, shoreline. line. As I said, the locals use their own beans and containers, whatever they can find to recover crude palm oil. Uh, the wheelie beans provided by the responsible party were also uh, used as containers. The temporary uh, stored crude palm oil were pumped back into the portable tanks, tractors that came down, lined up at the uh, waterfront. And the recovery crude oil were taken back uh, by these tanks, portable tankers and tractors back to the factory. Uh, responsible party for treatment and recovery for maybe future export. The, uh, the, it, the responsible party has the facility there to also treat the uh, recovered crude palm. And uh, one other thing that the, uh, for interest, for your interest only is the company also asked the locals that uh, if you there to sell back the uh, oil, the palm oil that they collected from the uh, so, so line, so that gave them the a financial, uh, what can I say, some returns. So that made the people to really dig deep into making the, containing the uh, fuel, uh, the oil, by collecting them on their own and selling back to, uh, back to the company. So that uh, you can see that made uh, people to work hard in order to clean the saw line, but at the same time, they were selling back the uh, discharge uh, crude oil back to the company for some so for some money amount of money. So just uh, some poor uh, thoughts on the type of containers used, uh, the wheelie beans, the 40, 40 liter containers, buckets, any form of container. And this, of course, you see with banana leaves covered. These are the containers that will be sold back to the company. 
So whoever owns the bucket at least have some uh, money in his pocket by the end of the day. Okay, whatever container or containment was equipment around cities a banana boat, they made uh, good use of it by uh, putting the oil back, getting ready for the company to pump it back into the portable tanks with the hoses already on standby. So that's how the people are so eager to clean the environment. And as I said, uh, if it was for crude oil, diesel, and petroleum, then the scenario would have been uh, a bit different. And this is also one of its first of its kind uh, for a crude palm oil to spill out into the sea. So uh, it was an eye opener for National Maritime Safety Authority offices to go down and actually have a first hand on seeing an actual oil spill, actual spill in the form of vegetable or palm oil, crude palm oil. These are the tanks, two tankers from the, uh, the company and the portable tractor with containers pumping out the, sucking back the oil, uh, crude, crude palm oil back into the tanks. And then of course, they'll take it back to the uh, refinery. Okay, the impacts. Uh, there was actually no wildlife impact as observed, both by uh, NMSA and the uh, responders from NPB and BPOL. Uh, there were no visible environmental impact or observed, as you can uh, you, you saw from the uh, images how clean the beach was. Uh, but there were uh, there may be a potential impact on the coral. Uh, coral reef from some sunken crude palm, the area beach that must have uh, sank or sunk into the uh, onto the reef, but they yet to be ascertained by uh, divers. To date, uh, nothing has come to our notice regarding the uh, this, the oil that was assumed to be uh, caught in the reefs under the sea. Uh, there was no visible impacts on the shoreline. There were a few complaints from the locals from their skin being uh, rashes on the skin and irritation, but the uh, complaints were managed by the health and safety uh, department from NPBOL and also our community development offices from National Maritime Safety, with, uh, safety Authority with the good uh, public relations. And uh, it was all good. All good committees did participate. They understood. They were happy at the end of the day. Uh, first and foremost was the effort that they put assisting the company uh, and MSA to make sure their beats of uh, soil line was safe and uh, free from crude palm oil. Uh, these are just uh, pictures of how the soil line looked a few days later. All the way, so just a okay. This is the the pictures of the tankers that uh, normally come into the bay to pick up the crude, just to give an idea on what type of tankers come in. And this is the sizes that they come in to collect the crude pump. And imagine also if there is a spill from these tankers uh, again into the harbor, then the scenario of oil will change because. By then, they'll be away from the source, and maybe the crude palm would have drifted away from the source. That would have made it difficult uh, for the responders to contain at the first instance. So just uh, to show you, show you these pictures of these tankers, and then uh, maybe we can just see two different scenarios, one from the tanker if it happens, and one from the shoreline line which it happened and we, uh, it was contained. Okay, this is the short conclusion. The Kimbe Palm Oil Preparedness Response was a success because uh, they were trained personnel and it was an uh, efficient response by the responders. Uh, one thing I said earlier, the National Maritime Safety Authority being the respons uh, responsible state agency, 
does not usually take lead in any types of oil. It is the industries that conduct or operate this business. But uh, they are the first responders, they got equipment, and also they have uh, their contingency plan, site plans, we call them. The site plans that uh, we always, our team go down, do inspections, and they make sure they're up to date on par with what our changes go about within the uh, response, uh, preparedness and response for oil. Okay, the palm uh, oil was effectively contained and recovered by the responsible party, the personal assistance and assistance from local uh, during the solar and cleanup. It was observed uh, no potential impact on the wildlife, on the marine environment, and there was no visible uh, damage on the solar line itself. The minor issues raised, as I said earlier, was from locals regarding skin rashes and uh, eyes uh, being irritated by the palm, but it was addressed by the health and safety and the NMSA is uh, community development offices. Okay, uh, one uh, point I just want to make mention to our uh, our other resource speakers. PNG National Maritime Sa uh, Safety Authority has got an agreement in place with uh, oil sales, oil sales uh, response limited in Singapore. So at a, uh, in the meantime, uh, at the moment, uh, they are working on our national contingency plan, and uh, which is good. We are very much happy to be part of the professional uh, organization who is a leading agency in the world to date. And we are pleased to be part and uh, organization to be on board with uh, OSR of Singapore. And uh, maybe one question I think we should have in mind or you might be asking is, how do we classify this type of oil? Is it uh, chemical oil or is it oil as oil oil? Well, I think it's kept in our national plan where uh, a good man, a Norman can uh, maybe later on just emphasize to other presenters for their, uh, to give them an example where NMSA uh, PNG is now with a uh, national uh, with oil sets uh, response limited Singapore. And that concludes uh, my presentation, but I'll have a good, uh, a good picture of all you smart people from the last meet that we uh, together the uh, Singapore Maritime Gallery. Thank you very much, uh, everyone. And we'll uh, hope we'll see more of each other in the near future. And thank you, Norman. Uh, thanks, thanks, my good man, Johnson. Uh, all right, so can I get uh, Ali to uh, turn on your video as well? Uh, we are now at the plenary. Uh, we will try to answer the questions that our participants have. Uh, so Ali, can I get you to on your video? Yes, I know. Oh. Yeah, and uh, really interesting, Johnson, for your... Uh, huh. For your presentation, really the palm oil, um, really an eye opening for us because most of the time we are only thinking about uh, hydrocarbon oil, uh, but not really uh, oil coming from say uh, plant-based oil like the palm oil that, that you have. So we are now at the plenary, so we encourage our participants to uh, write down your questions. So if you have one, uh, so we have one question from one of our participants, and I think this one is directed to Ali. So Ali, the question is this. So does NIBA, or I think maybe SEMA as well, uh, include any consideration of cultural, archaeological, or native rights? So basically, that's the question. So does NIBA or SEMA uh, include or consider this uh, sort of um, I would say this is like a resource consideration. Okay, I think this is where actually SEMA helping uh, to to look at the transition in terms of uh, NIBA, which is is look like is very uh, environmental focus uh, principle, but it's actually not. I mean, if you look at the resource compartment, the eight resource compartment that we put, there's a high value resources. So this is actually where we put the cultural, uh, archaeological artifact a resource compartment that might be impacted by oil. And it did actually show up in one of the example where uh, if 
there's an area that probably going to be impacted by spill and it is sacred land and it need to have input from the local stakeholders and this is something that we believe that uh, will get impacted uh, looking at the degree of oiling as well, of course, the, the possibility. I guess this is where actually SEMA helped to look at a broader view, not only the environmental, ecological impact, but also socioeconomic and also cultural in, uh, uh, sensitivity, I think, like the ecological and artifact. I hope this answering the question, Roman. Yeah, so I, I guess what you're saying, Ali, is that um, NIBA transitioning to SEMA or SEMA being a process under NIBA uh, basically, SEMA now captures a lot more resource compartment because most of the time, we are, if there's an oil spill, we only think about in terms of environmental and socioeconomic. But actually, when you have the SEMA, you're also looking into other aspects, for example, your archaeological or cultural uh, sort of heritage. Yes, Norman. Yeah. All right. Uh, I think let's see uh, if there are any other questions. So we are encouraging our participants to uh, type your question and we hope that answers the question of uh, Ian uh, because Ian uh, made that question. So hope, hope that answers the question. Um, for uh, Johnson, I, I think uh, quick, quick question, uh, Johnson. So aside from the, you mentioned there were no impacts, but um, any, any complaints from the, the locals aside from the rashes that they develop or anything else that they that they uh, complained about? Uh, no, man, uh, not really. Uh, they were just, they were initially told before not to particip participate. They would talk to the leaders, the uh, village councillors, uh, all the leaders of the villages telling them that it, it, this is an incident where the company will be respond, responsible. However, because of the uh, community engagement by the uh, company, uh, people were just, you know, they couldn't help, they wanted to help. So it's just that it wasn't a problem, but they were just saying, oh, okay, this is what's happening to us. So then the responsible people from the health and safety court went down and told them, all right, you have to wash properly, rinse yourself like this and that, and you should not oil the, uh, put your hands in the oil and start rubbing your eyes. So initially, like mistakenly, they were in a rush, uh, excited about what they were doing, and they were touching the eyes. So when they were advised on the uh, some some uh, do not not to do thing, then I think from there they they understood they understood the. So, but that was some of this initial, uh, not more 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 or less a complaint, but kind of a wake up thing that it was observed but it was contained in a more uh, amicable way by uh, the safe, uh, safety and health and occupational or safety people for the organization. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thanks, Johnson. That's, that's, a, uh, that's a, a good thing happening in, in this field. And, I, and, I, and I'm pretty sure uh, there was a lot of lessons learned uh, from those, uh, from that uh, incident. Um, I think we don't have a lot of questions uh, for, for this webinar. Uh, so I'll just give a couple more minutes. Uh, and if not, then we will uh, move to close out this uh, webinar. But I guess I, I have one more question for, for Ali uh, with regards to the NIBA and SEMA. So basically, Ali, what you have shown is uh, an example of SEMA for, say, an offshore spill. Uh, but would there be could that be tailor fit as well? If, for example, the the spill already reached the shoreline, uh, would that be would SEMA be able to be you know would be tailor fit if 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 for example your scenario is is that the oil spill is already on the shoreline, is that possible to do? Uh, yes, I think this is something that we we did actually also well. I think we 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 did run workshop just to look if we can use SEMA specific for shoreline response because in, in shoreline response we're talking about uh, different tools in, in response there's strategy that's tactical so this is also also something that we can uh, benefiting of using SEMA different tactics when you try to clean up the shoreline it might be uh, having a, a good benefit to look at the resource department and different tactic might have different positive or negative outcome that might present and just to highlight again, yes, it's possible. We did that already, and, and uh, I think 
uh, a lot of people uh, were were quite uh, uh, appreciate how we did that using SEMA. But again, yeah, if it's possible to do more specific, if it is near shore and shoreline. Right, and I suppose if we do that uh, SEMA for shoreline, then the resource compartment would also change. Is that correct? Yeah, the resource compartment probably will will be uh, changed. Looking at the, uh, the the more specific issue in, in, in different shoreline is uh, uh, is it the, the top uh, so soil the, the below soil and so on is the habitat and then so it got to be specific as well. Just the same, it will be different. The response strategy will not be uh, shoreline response, but it's not talking about tactical in terms of shoreline. Is it protect protecting the shoreline? Is it uh, clean up using manual or clean up using mechanical? This is something that we can put as the response option. All right. This, uh... right. Thanks. Thanks, Ali. So I guess we don't have uh, a lot of questions for uh, this afternoon. So we will try to sum up what we have. So first and foremost, uh, thank you very much for our resource speakers, uh, to uh, Ali and uh, my man, Johnson. And to our audience, please do complete and submit the attendance and feedback form. Uh, you can see the QR code in your screens and also I shared the link uh, on the chat box. So please do complete that. And uh, please do indicate on the feedback form whether you would like to have a certificate for this uh, sharing. Um, just to let everybody know, uh, we would like to see you again on our last webinar. So our last webinar will be scheduled in the quarter four of this year. Uh, and then you will you will be able to find the sign up for upcoming webinars in uh, or oil spill response website. Um, and uh, please do follow uh, OSRL in Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter, YouTube, and Instagram. Same thing for uh, the at C2. You will be able to follow them as well in the Facebook, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, and YouTube. So with that. Um, Thank you, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and participation in this webinar. And we hope to see you in person soon. Uh, until then, please keep yourselves and families safe and well. And have a good afternoon to all. So thank you very much. Thank you, Norman. And thank you, Ali. Thank you, everyone. Thanks, my man, Johnson. Hope to see thank you again you, in Papua New Guinea. Yes, we will thank see you. you soon yeah thank, thank you, you. All. thank you for hosting thank you etsy as well for giving the time thank you all